And our key verse today, as I've already indicated to you, is verse 23, building on what we developed, particularly in last week's sermon. Whoever is not with me, Jesus says, is against me. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. So as we heard last week in last week's sermon, Jesus says, game on. And we looked at what that meant in this context and how he's claiming all of scripture and bringing it through this passage. And we said there's gonna be no neutrality. Now we really focus in on this. And today we're gonna focus first on the crisis as we apply this. Secondly, Christ, his cross and his calling. So the crisis, we gotta deal with the reality of the crisis. We look to the gospel of Christ and his cross and his calling. And then finally, to us, our choice. Our choice in the light, in the glorious light of Christ and his cross and calling. Now let's open God's word. We will again read Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 23. And again, for the first, all the first portions of this into the last verse, I encourage you to dig back into what we exegeted the last two Sundays with devil's defeat, undivided love, and then last week's sermon as well, Jesus says, game on. Hear now God's word. Now, he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and people marveled. But some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, to test Jesus, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Your juniors will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Key verse for last Sunday's sermon, of course. Jesus says, game on. And then elaborating on that, the parable. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he, stronger than the strong man, attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil, the mission of Jesus. And now we get to verse 23. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Parents, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but Nancy and I were, if just for a few brief moments. We didn't have to deal with this at the level many people do, but let me just tell you this. When you lose your child, no one's neutral. When you lose your child, no one's neutral. There is no neutrality when a life is on the line. When you're worried about your child being lost forever, people are either gonna help you or if they fail to help you, if they're gonna be passive or say, well, that's interesting, let me check the latest social media feed, they are working against you. They're either on your team or they're not. There is no neutral ground, no gray zone. Well, this is a nuanced question. <laughs> no, no, when your child is lost, you are, they're either going to help you or they're not. The clock's ticking. People who are not willing to help are in effect against the effort. Do you understand what I'm saying? If they're not going to help you, if you've got a kid drowning in the water and they're going to sit on the shore and say, well, this is an interesting dilemma, they are working against you and the life of your child. Uh, have you ever lost your child? Ever lost a grandchild? Well, Nancy and I did in one situation. We were in a large-scale situation 
years ago when Faith was, I think, around 10 months old and Grace was about to turn three. We have two daughters, younger one's Faith, older one's Grace. When Grace was about to turn three, we went to Universal Studios. It's a big place. There are tens of thousands of people. They're all over the place. And this kind of dates us. I'm a lot older than most of you are, so most of you will not remember this, but there was a phenomenon in the 1990s and the first decade of this century called Barney, a big purple dinosaur, Barney and Friends. That was the big deal. And uh, in fact, I was tempted to include the Barney song as one of our hymns today, but Johnny's saying no, no, okay. All right, so. Uh, so we, we went to Barney and Friends. They had this big theatrical production in this huge studio that they had built out in Universal Studios. They had this for about 20 years. And we saw this production with Barney and Friends and you know the little children are going crazy and love all these characters that come out singing. And then when it was over, there was this huge play area and activity area in the entire little sub-complex of Universal Studios for young children called Barney and Friends. So we go out there and Nancy and I, and Grace and Faith, we were with a friend, uh, one of Grace's best friends from church and from where we lived at the time in Florida. And she was a few weeks older than Grace, but basically the same age. And so the way it got divvied up is, you know, they were the big girls. They were three years old. So they're out on the play area, and our, our uh, friend, who was the dad of the other girl, he got charged with being in, in, you know, overseeing the girls. I went out there for a while. Grace is playing with her friend, Rachel. And then I go back in to check on Nancy and to see Nancy and baby Faith. And I'm sure to take a picture of baby Faith because they were hanging around inside the facility. Faith couldn't play yet. She's in a stroller. And a few minutes later, I come back out. Mike's in charge. His name was Mike. He's in charge of both girls. And I, I walk out there and I see Mike very much diverted with his own daughter. And I'm looking around for Grace and I'm not seeing Grace. And my heart missed several beats, I'm sure, at that moment. And Nancy's back with Faith, and I'm in a dilemma, and I tell Nancy, I don't see Grace, where is she? I go to Mike, where is Grace? And he said, oh, she was just here a minute or two ago. And we're in this Universal Studios complex with all these, you know, a thousand people waiting to get into the next Barney show outside, all these people walking around all over the place, and we cannot find Grace. So immediately, when you lose your child, no one is neutral. So we start asking for help. Can you imagine this? And one of the things that happened, which was kind of interesting at the time, now this is years ago, this is a quarter century ago, but um, Nancy asked one of the employees, I don't know if this was somebody, what level they were, but Nancy says, you need to institute the lost child protocol. This area needs to be, you know, locked down or we need some kind of all hands on deck type of thing. And the employee said, there is no lost child protocol. And basically the idea was these things happen. What are you gonna do? You know, there are thousands of people here. Good luck with trying to find your child. And that was kind of the response we got from several people. And all of a sudden it really hit me. Look, I need you guys on my side. If you're not on my side, you're basically working against me because the clock is ticking. Every minute, my three-year-old daughter could be moving further away or be carried further away from where I am right now. This is a crisis situation. When a child's drowning, delaying on the shore and thinking about it, being distracted on the shore, getting into a debate about the current phase of the culture and water out there in the lake, this is, this is not helping any. When your child's in danger, no one's neutral. Staying on the shore, not doing anything is what? A choice for death. A choice for death. 
which brings us back to Jesus' mission, which we really focused on in Devil's Defeat, Undivided Love a couple weeks ago. And remember, we looked at what John the Apostle gives us as the key overarching coordinate for Jesus' mission. Yes, of course, John records in John's Gospel, chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. But why? What was the agenda? What's the mission? Yes, of course, Jesus came to seek and save the lost, as he's going to say in Luke's Gospel, uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 10. But what's the overarching agenda? Well, John, the apostle, gives it to us in the second part of 1 John, chapter 3, verse 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And then the Apostle Paul's great summary of what this mission means for those of us who are saved, front part. It's, it's the kingdom gospel conveyed through the Apostle Paul in the, the conflict of the kingdoms. The dominion of darkness, the dominion of the deceiver, being overtaken by the dominion of light, the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. And here's what Paul says. He, God, has rescued us, we read this in the call to worship, from the domain of darkness and done what? Did he just kind of rescue us from Satan and leave us out to wander around on our own? <laughs> no. There's two parts to this. Now catch this. He has rescued us from the domain of the darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of totally different kingdom, of his beloved son. So what does this mean for us? Well, it's going to continue. The story's going to continue. Are we just lifeless trophies that Jesus has? Are we just fans sitting in the stands applauding the team down on the field? Are we people on the shore checking our latest social media post while children drown? Is that who we are? No. We are called to action. But catch this, and we're going to dig into this today. Our ministry, our action, is not retribution, but reconciliation. We are to be not revenge seekers, but reconcilers in the grace of Christ. Paul puts it this way. Uh, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look, we used to look at other people from a worldly point of view, from the, the view of the flesh, Paul says, from a worldly point of view. But we don't any longer. In fact, Paul convicts himself and convicts all of us. We used to look at Jesus that way. Like we didn't understand who Jesus was and, and what, what it means to actually call him Lord and Savior, right? Then Paul says, no, 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 now we no longer do that. And anyone who is in Christ is an entirely new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. And so what does that mean? 2 Corinthians 5, 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. In other words, he saved us from the devil and from sin and deception. And he saved us unto himself to bring us back into communion with him. Reconciled us to himself. And then here it is gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Yes, of course, Jesus has decisively justified us on the cross, but it turns out he also then in reconciling us, in justifying us, gives us this ministry to continue to live in communion of Christ. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. As Peter puts it in... Um, 1 Peter chapter 3, when you're facing a hostile world, what are you supposed to do? Just beat them at being hostile? Come down on them, just like all the cable news talk show dudes do, including those who call themselves Christian? Just attack and be a culture warrior all over the place, attacking people? You don't see that in the New Testament, do you? No. I know that's what a lot of Christians are prone to do in their flesh. And I know that's really popular nowadays, but that's not the ministry he gives us. Peter, 
Luther says this in Hostile World, always be ready to give the reason for the hope, not the vengeance you have, the hope you have. And how are you supposed to do it? 1 Peter 3.15, do it with all gentleness and respect. It's going to be a gathering ministry, not an attack and cut off the heads ministry. And Jesus says in this, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather, let me just tell you that verb there in the Greek, synoge, is the word from which you get, you know this word actually kind of, you know, where do Jewish people normally gather for worship? A synagogue, right? Same term here, synagogue. Gather, pull together, work with me to pull people together. Satan divides and conquers. Jesus comes to gather. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is clearly a call to action, but a call to action in gathering. So let me just go ahead and, and go to this briefly. Side note, little excursus here for you, because you may get this. When skeptics inside the church and outside of the church may tell you, well, Jesus is all over the place and he contradicts himself all over the place and the Bible is obviously totally fallible because it contradicts itself all over the place. Look, when I say gather, you need to be prepared to know the truth and understand the difference between the truth and falsehoods that are floated inside the church and outside the church. So let me just go to this. Some people will say, well, this is obviously in conflict with what Jesus uh, says in Luke chapter 9, verse 50, for instance, when Jesus says to John, one of his, well, actually the apostle I've been talking about, do not stop him for the one who is not against you is for you. That's Luke 9.50. The one who is not against you is for you. Okay? Isn't that obviously in direct conflict with, conflict with Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me? No, not quite. Not at all, in fact. Let me go into two levels of analysis of this with you briefly. First of all, remember the context of Luke chapter 9, verse 50. Let's go back to Luke 9.49. John answered and says this, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. Now notice the total conflict, uh, contrast here. Now Luke 9, 50, the one who is not against you, Jesus says. You catch that? You, that second person plural, him on, okay? The one who is not against you is for you. He's talking about the disciples, and the disciples are saying, these guys are out, you know, rescuing people from the devil, but they're not with us. They're not insiders with us. They don't go to our particular church. Or they don't, <laughs> so, so, and Jesus says, look, look, look I'm, I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a bigger ministry here, okay? I'm going to bring some more people into you. It doesn't matter that they're not with you right now, okay? That's the context of Luke 9, verse 50. And contrast that with Luke eleven twenty three, 23, when Jesus says, whoever is not with me. You understand there is a world or a cosmic world of difference between the disciples, between you and Jesus, right? When you get to Jesus, it is one or the other. Okay? So, that's, so me is very different than you, plural, you guys right now, as you are developed at the stage of Luke 9. I will also note in Mark chapter 11, verse 39, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon to speak evil of me. Jesus points that out in the parallel passage as recorded in Mark chapter 11. But now let's go to the larger context. You may have already kind of seen this coming. I haven't seen this in any commentaries, but this is clearly what's going on here. So since we've been focused on this for three Sundays, let me give this to you. Remember the larger context. Jesus has come to defeat the works of the devil, right? 
Okay, so here's the larger context. The mission against the kingdom of darkness to free children. Now let's go back and look at Luke chapter 9. When John asked his question, saying, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, what's he picking up on? We'll go back one more verse. Luke 9, 48. This is the famous teaching where Jesus says, whoever receives this child, did you catch that? Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And if you receive me, you receive the one who sent me. Okay. Notice Jesus is talking about gathering children. And the context is going to be his war to free children from Satan. Now, here's what you need to notice. These guys working in Jesus' name are, develop, are, are delivering children from the devil. John picks up on the name thing and says, you're talking about in your name, Jesus? Well, let me tell you, because we've been really upset about these people who are doing stuff in your name but aren't in our inside group. And Jesus says, you're missing the whole point. If they're serving my mission, they will eventually come to me. They will be in the church that I'm developing. But in the meantime, you're missing the message and worried about politics inside the church. That's what's going on there. And then sure enough, what's the next verse after Luke 9:50? Again, I've highlighted this for you pretty heavily. One of the most important verses in the entire Bible for your salvation, maybe the most important verse, when Jesus it comes to pass when the days were approaching for his ascension, he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus made the choice to go to Jerusalem to die, to set you free. That's right after this exchange. It's all clearly in context here. And remember, he's been talking with Moses and Elijah at the transfiguration right before this exchange about his exodus. So it's the big exodus not just the precursor that you read about in the Old Testament, the big exodus where he's going to deliver people from slavery into salvation and into the true promised land and communion with God forever. That's why he's talking about his exodus, his departure with Moses and Elijah. Now, what is this mission? Well, the day with this gathering language, I've really been drawn back to where I was drawn last Sunday to. I'm going to take you through it. It's a lot of scripture. Hang with me, and you're going to see the connections. The first of the five Gospels of the New Testament. What are you talking about? There's only four Gospels in the New Testament. Yes, but remember, there was one that was written 700 years before Jesus came, known as Isaiah. It's flat out a New Testament Gospel in so many ways, and certainly the servant song. So let's just pick this up from uh, the second servant song towards the end, and we'll work back through this. This is the background for the parable Jesus gives about overtaking the strong man. It's clearly, Jesus is claiming this. This is the ministry of the servant in the second servant song. The rhetorical question, God asks, can the prey be taken from the mighty man? Do you see that? There, there it is. That's the parable right there. Can the prey be taken from the mighty man or captives of a tyrant be rescued? Surely, thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty man will be taken away. This is what Jesus is talking about in Luke 11. And the prey of the tyrant will be rescued. For I will contend with the one who contends with you, and I will save your children. God himself will come and save your children. He's not neutral at all. And this is his mission when he comes the very son of God. Now, let's go back again. What's going on in Isaiah? Here's the gospel in Isaiah. Just briefly, some highlights here. From Isaiah chapter 40, verses 10 and 11. Behold, the sovereign Lord himself will come with a mighty hand, and his arm shall rule for him. When is this realized? When Jesus comes. Okay. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. What's he going to be like? Like Muhammad chopping people's heads off? No. Look at this. Like a shepherd, he will pasture his flock in his arm. Did you anticipate this? He will gather. Do you see that? Same language Jesus is using. He's circling you all around Isaiah, 
and the gospel given to us in Isaiah. He will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. Those with young he shall gently lead. Let's go back to the second of the four servant songs. Uh, picking up at verse 5. Now, then the Lord says, He who formed me, this is the servant speaking, uh, in, in dialogue with God. He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be, do you see it? Gathered. That Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, this is awesome. This is opening up the Great Commission. This is the New Testament and the Old, verses 6 and 7. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light to the nations, to all the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, this is Jesus all the way through the cross, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has, there's the Messianic, he has chosen you. And then to the close of 49, picking up on the second servant song, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples. This is the crucified Lord who is raised unto glory. I mean, that, that's the signal. And they shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings will be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me, remember Isaiah 40, those who wait shall be renewed. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. There it is again in 49. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Can the prey be taken from the mighty? I mean, can people be delivered from Satan? Yeah, absolutely. Captives of a tyrant rescued? For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken and the prey of the tyrant rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you and I will save your children. How? How does he do it? Well, we got to go to the fourth servant song in the final stanza. Isaiah 53, 10 through 12. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, the servant, and to cause him to suffer. And when his soul makes an offering for their guilt, he will see his offspring. There it is. He doesn't have biological children, but he has a whole lot of seed, all those who are saved in him. And prolong his days, and the Lord's will shall prosper his hand. From the suffering work of his soul, he will see light. There's the resurrection and the glory of the family of God redeemed and be satisfied by his knowledge the righteous one my servant will justify many many for he will bear their iniquities and here it is back to the parable of jesus therefore i will apportion out to him the many and the strong he will apportion as spoil the devil's going down his house is going down upon the fact that he poured out listen to this he didn't chop the devil's head off he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. This is how he wins. For he himself bore the sin of many and for the transgressors made intercession. That's how. So that's his cross and his calling, but let's go back to our application. First of all, the crisis, then Christ and his cross and calling, and finally our choice. Here's the crisis, time is short. Parents, time is short. You know, people are always like, I can't believe he's in second grade now, or he's in kindergarten now, or he's in 12th grade now. Yeah, time is short. How are you really shaping and directing your days? Their days. Time is short, judgment is clear, death is forever, hell's forever. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus says, but the workers are few. Why? It's because not many people want to gather. Everybody wants to have their own glory and fight among themselves. Listen, harvest, Jesus uses this language. Now notice this, this is shocking. We are expecting, after all this war talk and war with Satan stuff, when we get to uh, Luke eleven twenty three, that Jesus is going to say, war's on. But he says he wins the war by gathering, and he's calling us to gather with him. What's gathering language? 
three, three points of reference. Harvest, shepherding, and parenting. Do you follow me? And these are metaphors and parables that Jesus uses all through his ministry. And what's the thing about the harvest? Harvest is short. You can't say, I'll get back to the harvest. I'm busy right now, but in three years, I'll go out there and gather the produce. It rots. Time is short. Time in your life and with your children is short. Time in the ministry and the life God gives you is short. It is fleeting. It goes by fast. You think you've got all the time in the world and I'm just going to do the same old, same old. You are wasting and squandering your life and their life. Time is precious. Judgment is clear. If the harvest does not happen, it does not happen. If a child is at risk, and they are at risk, believe me, in the 21st century, things can happen really fast. If a sheep is lost, why would the shepherd leave the 99 to go save the one? Because time is short and in peril. This is a crisis that the Bible is fully clear to us about. Time's fleeting. Our options in addictions and what we just kind of do, because that's what kind of suits our fancy for today, they seem like they're going to go on forever. They will not. Children are precious to God, but in, parable, in peril of perishing. And then let's go to two. I've talked about this, but let's check in on this. Christ, cross, and calling. He comes not as the beheading warrior, but as the shepherd king. The scripture focuses in on this as his prophecies. This is who is born in Bethlehem, the shepherd who will gather his people. Isaiah, the shepherd who will gather his flock like lambs. And he does it by giving his life. His gospel war and way is not the way of the flesh or the world. He gives his life to seek us and to see us. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the little sheep. And here's the great commission again. And I have other sheep that are not from this fold. And I must bring them in. I must gather them also. How? by giving his life. Not by cutting people's heads off, not by attacking them verbally, but by laying down his life. Are you, are we with Jesus? That's the way he gathers, giving ourselves away in sacrificial love, in redeeming grace. His way, his gospel. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Yeah, it has. And he tells us how to apply it. Join Jesus then in gathering children his way. What's his way? We are ambassadors of reconciliation. As Paul says also in Ephesians 6, verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this struggle this present darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. So therefore, as Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not weapons of the world. They're not weapons of the flesh. But they have divine power to destroy Satan's strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought, every thought captive to obey Christ. Which brings us then finally to our choice. Are we with him or not? You can say, yeah, sure, I'm glad Jesus did all that for me. Now let me assert my own self. That is not being with Jesus. This is the way I like to do things. This is the way I like to push people around. Yeah, you're not with Jesus. Come to Jesus, to the gospel of gathering. Gather, do not scatter. He says it, and he's the Lord, and he will judge the living and the dead. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Come to him. He 
is giving us an urgent call to act. The harvest is short. Lost sheep die quickly. And when they're dead, they're dead. Every Lord's Day is precious. I know, we're busy. Really? Every teachable moment with children and teenagers is precious. Yeah, but I just got so much going on. Or I'm being entertained to death. Yeah, I know. Repent. Turn back to the gatherer, the God of the gospel, Jesus himself. Will there be hardship? I mean, will in this current generation, will people criticize you? Even your own children will say, oh, come on, mom, come on, dad, or come on, uncle, Joe. Yeah, sure. Will there be persecution? Yeah, will we run into hardship, including on social media? Yeah, that's the world we live in. Just like Jesus says and Paul says, Satan is the god of this age. But who's going to win? Christ. And it is the Jesus who opened his hands and opened his heart wide to gather all his children. He didn't go after us with the sword. He shed his own blood, broke his own heart, that you might be transformed and we might be people of loving grace to gather with him. Come to him and let us bring that good news even to the nations. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.